A couple weeks ago, I was driving around, and I ran across this billboard that I want you to look at. The name has been taken off, but... Life is hard. We make church easy. It caught my attention. So I drove back, and I looked at it again, and I got a picture of it. Life is hard, but it's church easy. And it made me think. It made me think, well, what is church? And that's a question you need to ask yourself. I mean, why are you a part of a church family? Why do we attend the services we do? Why, why do you participate? Why do you give? Why do you serve? I mean, why do we do all this? Why are we looking at improving our building situation? Why do we give money? I mean, why, why do we do all these things? Because never do anything in life without understanding the purpose of why you're doing it. Never get involved in anything without spending some time to understand, to figure out what is the purpose of this. Some of you have been coming to church for 50 years. Some of you are new to church. Some of you may be visiting this morning. But the question is the same for all of us. What is church? I mean, what is the biblical definition of church? I've talked about this several times, so I'm not going to get into a lot of this. But if you look in the Bible, the church is described a few different ways in the Bible. It's described as a family. It's described as a body the body of Christ. It's described as the bride of Christ. So I want you to think about those three things. I mean, if most of you, no, not most of you, all of you are in a family. Is that easy? No. All of you have a body. And if it's an aging body, (laughs) is that easy? No. And some of you, maybe most of you are married, have a spouse. Is that easy? (laughs) Not always, right? Right, it's not, it's not. I mean, so it's not always easy, but those things, I will say, they're good. They're good. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at the purpose of the church because that sign really got me thinking about this, and I thought, you know, this is something we need to talk about. This is something we need to review. It's a good thing to review every year. What is the purpose of the church? And so I'm going to go through about... I don't know, four or five different purposes of the church. And as I do this, understand this. This is not all of them, okay? This is not an exhaustive list because if I did that, we would be here a very, very long time. And I'm trying to condense this as much as possible. So here's the first purpose that most of us think of when we think of the word church, and that is worship. Worship. And these are not ranked, by the way. These are not in the order of importance. So the first one is worship. Because the Bible tells us that we were created as an object of God's love. God made you to love you. So he wants to have a relationship with you. The most important thing that you can understand is that God loves you, that he made you to love you. The most important thing that you can do in life is to love God back. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, there's a term in the Bible for expressing love to God, and that term is worship. All right, now, we like to think of worship a lot of times as a ritual, it's a routine, it's something that we come to church to do on Sunday morning, but as already been discussed this morning by Jeremy, that's not worship, okay? Worship is anything that you are doing to simply express love to God. Anytime you're expressing love to God, you are worshiping God, whether it's by yourself, whether you're in a small group, whether you're in a large group setting, You know, whether you're driving down the car and singing, you know, at the top of your lungs, when you are expressing love to God, you are worshiping. Here's the thing about worship, and again, this is already said, worship is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. So I'm just going to look at six ways that we can worship, that we can live a life of worship, a lifestyle of worship in our lives. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, this is just a partial list. The first way is one that we're pretty good here at Millersburg Christian Church, and it's it's the one that everybody thinks of when they think of worship. When you say the worship, worship, most people think, well, that's singing. That's singing. Well, that's part of it. I mean, music and love, they go together because music comes from the heart. It's not something you do intellectual. It's something that comes out of your soul, out of your emotions. Over the last 2,000 years, there have been more songs written about Jesus more songs written to Jesus than any other subject. You see, Christianity is a singing faith. Why? Because it's not about religion. It's about love. It's about a relationship with God. 
and that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Psalm 147, 7 says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God. Well, there's a second way to live a lifestyle of worship, and that is by talking to God. Another word for talking to God is what? Prayer. Prayer. Now, <clears throat> it took me a while. Okay, I'm admit, I'm a slow learner. I, I am, all right? But I finally figured out this marriage thing, all right? I'm, I'm a little dense sometimes, but I finally figured out that, you know, the key ingredient to a successful marriage is talk. And if you've ever gone through my premarital counseling classes, you know I will hammer this to death, that you need to communicate, 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 all right? I mean, because I discovered on the days that I have deep soul communication with Heidi, those are the days that our relationship grows. On the days that I don't have deep soul communication with her, it's just like, hey, how are you? Hope you had a good day. Good night. You know, that's when the relationship decays. And here's the thing about relationships. They're never standing still. They're either growing or they're decaying. And the same is true with God. On the days that I have deep soul communication with God, my relationship with him is growing. But on the days that I have little or no communication with God, then my relationship is decaying. It's that simple. And a lot of people, they hear that word pray, and they start to freak out. Well, I don't know how to pray. I can't pray. You know, I don't, what, 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 what do you do? Well, you talk to God. You talk to God like he's your best friend. You talk to God about anything you would talk to your best friend about. Everything. Your hopes, your fears, your dreams, your anxieties, the things you're embarrassed about, the things you're proud of, the things you're ashamed of, your goals, your ambitions, your hurts, your cares, every part of your life, you come to God and you talk about it. The Bible says in Psalm 116, 1 through 2, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. Well, there's a third way to live a lifestyle of worship, and that is by listening to God. By listening to God. Listening is one of the greatest gifts that you can give to anybody, the gift of listening. We all want to be understood. We all want to be listened to. And when you listen to someone, you are saying, you matter to me. When I listen to my children, when I listen to my wife, you know, which she says, you're not listening to me. And sometimes that's right. You know, when I listen to my wife, when I listen to anybody, what I am telling them is, you matter to me. You are important to me. I value your opinion. When I don't listen, what I'm basically saying is, you know what? It doesn't matter what you say. I, you don't matter to me. It's not important. One of the ways to express love to anybody is to listen to them. And the same is true with God. Every time you listen to God, you're saying, Look, God, you matter to me. I value what you have to say. Now, listening is the most misunderstood and left off part of prayer. We think that prayer is just talking to God. That's 50% of it. That's just 50%. The other 50% is shutting your mouth and sitting and listening to God. You know, it, it, I mean, but oftentimes we're in too big of a hurry. You know, and so we look at prayer, we go, okay, prayer is, I'm going to say this, dear God, Okay, here are the 10 things I need today. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Talk to you later. Over and out. See you later. Good buddy. You know, and we're done. Well, that's not it. Sometimes you just got to shut up, be still, and listen. Say, God, do you have anything you want to say to me? Is there a message that you want to get across to me? Is there something you need to say? We don't listen. Why? Because our lives are so full of noise. We always have a channel on, it's the radio, it's the TV, it's the computer, it's the tablets, it's the phones. You know, we have so many lines that even if God wanted to get through, all the lines are busy. Sometimes we need to take a pause from those things and sit in the quiet and say, God, do you need to speak to me? Jesus said this in 10, <clears throat> John 10, 14 through 16. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They will listen to my voice. Well, here's a fourth way to live a lifestyle of worship, and that is simply by being committed to him. Being committed to him. That's what love is about. It's about commitment. Nothing significant in life happens without commitment. 
Your commitments determine your future. You become what you are committed to. So you better choose your commitments very carefully. If you are committed to the wrong thing, then you're going to become the wrong thing. But here's the thing. You can't go wrong by being committed to God. What does it mean to be fully committed to God? Well, there are five basic commitments. Number one is giving your life to Jesus Christ. Number two, committing to his family, the body of Christ, the church, and joining a church family. Three, <clears throat> deciding to grow spiritually, becoming more and more like Jesus in your everyday character. Four, using your gifts and your talents and your abilities to serve him helping other people. Fifth, sharing the good news. And we're going to talk about these a little more in depth here in just a few minutes, but sharing the good news. But as you think about those five commitments I just listed there, what I want you to do is think about what steps do you need to take? I mean, where are you at? Maybe for some of you, you need to take the first step in deciding to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Maybe some of you need to commit to the church and, and be a part of the church, the body of Christ. Maybe some of you need to decide to grow spiritually, and so you get in your word, you open up your Bible on a daily basis, and you begin to read that, or you get involved in a small group. Or maybe it's using your talents and your gifts to serve within the church, sharing the good news. Maybe there's someone that you need to talk to about Jesus Christ. These are the five basic commitments. What step are you on? Jeremy already read this, but Romans 12.1 says this. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Commitment is a lost value in our society. A lot of people don't like commitment. A lot of people are afraid of commitment these days. You know, I don't want to be committed to anything. I don't want to be committed to any one person, any program, any career, you know, any relationship, any one church. I'm afraid of commitment. But love is being coming committed, personally committed to the people that you love. Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans 12.5. In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And if you're a believer, then you belong to everyone else who is a believer. You need other people. Other people need you. We belong to each other. Fifth way that we live a lifestyle of worship, by giving to him. By giving to him. Giving is the essence of, essence of love. As a matter of fact, you can spell love G-I-V-E. Because that's what love is all about. When you love someone, you want to give to them. Now understand this. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. It's impossible to do that. So if you say you love God, then it's going to show up in your generous lifestyle. I can claim to be a Christian. I can claim to be a follower of Christ. I can claim to love God, but the Bible says that there is one way that really tests the sincerity of your love. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 8. It says, just as you excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and complete earnestness, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. God tests the sincerity of our love by looking at our giving. Why does he do that? He doesn't need the money. He doesn't need it. What, what does he need? He needs your heart. He, need what you, he needs what your giving represents. He wants you to become like him. How is giving becoming like God? Well, for God so loved the world that he gave. Finally, here's a sixth way to live a lifestyle of worship. By publicly identifying with him. By not being ashamed of him at work, in your neighborhoods, in your family, and in your school, by not saying, I'm not going to let anyone know I'm a Christian. I'm not going to let my coworkers know. I'm not going to let the other kids at school know. I'm not going to let anyone in my family know. I'm not going to let anyone in my neighborhood know. Then you don't really love God. I mean, because when you love somebody, you're not ashamed of them. You want to publicly identify with them. I mean, imagine several years ago when I was dating Heidi, I went to Heidi and said, look, <clears throat> let's be committed to one another. Let's get married. And we'll be committed at home, but when we are out in public, let's act like we don't even know each other, like we're total strangers. Well, what do you think she would say to that? Are you kidding me? That's not love, you idiot. And she'd be right. 
Because when you love somebody, you're not publicly ashamed of them. You say, this is my husband, this is my wife. You take on that name, your family, you identify with each other. You can't say that you love Jesus Christ and be ashamed of him. Jesus said it like this, Mark 8, 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when, his father, when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me on earth, then I'm going to be ashamed of you in heaven. We need to publicly identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. That's how we show our love for him. So here's the bottom line when it comes to worship. Worship is not just something we do on a Sunday morning. It is a lifestyle. It's a daily lifestyle. And let me tell you something. Publicly identifying with him, giving, singing, talking to him, listening to him, it's not easy. But it is good. It is good. Look at Romans 12, 1 again, just before I leave this point. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as what? Living sacrifices? Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I don't know about you, but being a sacrifice is not easy. But again, it is good. Here's the second purpose I want to talk about the church this morning, and that is going, going, leading others to Christ. In other words, evangelism. Now, we put a lot of emphasis on worship. We put a lot of emphasis on what we do here on Sunday mornings. But this is probably the number one thing that the church should be doing. And honestly, it's the thing that we probably give the least attention to. And that's not good. That's something we need to change. We want people to understand that, that this is what makes Jesus' heart beat faster. Jesus himself said this in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And when Christianity becomes a relationship and not just a religion in your life, there's this sense that you want to tell other people. There was a recent survey done that, that of why or how people came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to see these statistics. Okay? 1% of people who came to Christ came through evangelistic crusades or revivals. That's why you don't see a lot of evangelistic crusades or revivals anymore. 4% came through church programs. 4% through Sunday school. 5% as walk-ins, just walked in the church. 8% because of the pastor. Now, if you're doing the math and you're keeping track, that's 22%. What about the other 78%? What about the majority? How did they come to Christ? Through friends and relatives. We found that the greatest way to reach people is through you. It's through you. It's through us reaching out to other people, our friends and our relatives. People don't come to this church because of me. They don't even have a clue who I am. But they will come if you invite them because they know you. <clears throat> so we want to encourage you to continue to bring people. Next Sunday would be a great Sunday to bring people. It's Youth Sunday. They don't have to listen to me. There's going to be children involved and youth involved. And, man, it'll be a great Sunday for you to invite some people to come. If you want to show the love of Christ... then you have to share Christ verbally. Tell them the good news. The most important thing that you can do to the people that you love is tell them the good news. That's what the Bible is all about. I mean, think about it. Why, why do we do all that we do? Why was this church formed? Why, why do we keep reaching out? Why do we keep increasing the budget and stretching our faith? 2 Corinthians 5.14 tells us, because Christ's love compels us. That is the motivation behind everything we do. God loves people. He loves people and he wants everybody to know about him. And we have to care because Jesus cares. Everybody needs Jesus. Life, Christ's love compels us. Love leaves no choice. So here's the thing. The bottom line of going. All right? Inviting people to church, leading others to Christ, it's not easy. But it is good. Purpose number three for the church, growing spiritually, growing spiritually. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, can be summarized in four words. Teach, okay, or sorry, go, teach, baptize, teach some more. The teaching doesn't stop when you make a commitment to Christ. 
It continues, and we have to make sure that we are growing and learning all that we can. Hosea chapter 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We want to make sure that we are growing and strengthening, and this happens through teaching. The word teach appears 96 times in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We're to study scripture on a regular basis. That's why we have Sunday school classes and men's group, and that's why we have, you know, small groups. And I'm going to challenge you, if you're not involved in one of those groups, if you're not involved in some type of group studying the Bible, that you get involved in a group and grow in that relationship. And also, if you're not looking at your Bible, if you're not reading the Word, doing daily devotions, I don't care if it's five minutes, ten minutes, spend some time daily in the Bible growing in your relationship with Christ. And here's the bottom line of growing spiritually. Growing spiritually, it's not easy, but it is good. It is good. Purpose number four, and this is the last one that I'm going to talk about today. There are many more. Purpose number four, show the love of Christ. So how do we do this? We do this by the do unto others. And the first one is accepting others unconditionally. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Everybody needs acceptance because nobody's perfect. We all have our faults. We all have our failures. We all have our weaknesses, our hangups. And as a result, we need acceptance because all have sinned. Nobody's perfect, so we accept one another. Second, we encourage others continually. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Build each other up. Everybody at some point in their life is going to go through a tough time, right? I think you're dead this morning. Everybody in life is going to go through a tough time at some point, right? Right? And is it that boring this morning? I'm just, I'm just checking, all right? But Christians of all people, Christians of all people ought to have a reputation. People ought to look at us and say, that person is an encourager. When everybody else in the world is tearing you down, they ought to be building you up, encouraging each other in the Lord. Third, serve people cheerfully. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various form. You see, God has given each of us talents and and abilities and, and gifts. God has given you talents, abilities, and gifts. Every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. Every Christian has talents and abilities. And the Bible says that we are used those talents and abilities and gifts for the benefit of everyone else, not just for your benefit. Okay, God has gifted me as a preacher not to bless me, but to bless you, I hope, or at least to give you a nice nap, which I think most of you were just taking a minute ago. <clears throat> God has given you gifts, not to bless you, but to bless me and other people. Our gifts are for each other, and God has done that so we depend on one another so that we grow in love. So why do we serve? Because we're needed. Listen, we're struggling in this area. We are having staff meetings and we are beating our heads against the wall recently because we do not have people stepping up the plate to serve. And as a staff, we're having to cover more and more things as the staff. And we're running thin. We need people to step up to the plate. Communion preparation, I mean, greeting, going out and serving the sick and shut in, the children's ministry, these areas are struggling because people are not stepping up to the plate. We need help, because my head can't be beat against the wall much longer. And we need help. You have given ability. I mean, I just want you to think. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the body as a unit, and and the the church is a unit. It's the body of Christ. And we're made up of many different parts, and we each have different functions within the body. Listen, on, on a normal Sunday, just for communion, okay, take that for instance. For communion to happen, I think it takes at least 15 people a Sunday morning, maybe more. That's probably short. By the time you go through preparation, the serving, communion meditation, clean up afterwards, at least 15, probably more. The worship service that you are sitting in right now takes at least 30 volunteers 
on a Sunday morning, when you talk about musicians, when you talk about children's ministry, when you talk about you know, people running soundboard and, and the computers and all these different things, at least 30 people. So in a normal week, when you take Sunday morning, Wednesday evenings with youth group and children's activities, you know, you're looking at about 60 volunteers plus. We need you. And again, I have to be honest, this is one of the areas we, we need people to get off the bench and get in the game. All right? And if you need to know, where can I serve? Come and talk to us, because we got a spot for you. But I think it comes back to commitment again. It takes commitment. 1 Corinthians 12 says, when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. It also says when one party rejoices, we all rejoice. And if you don't volunteer, then the entire body of Millersburg Christian Church is suffering. Ephesians 6, 7 says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. John 12, 26, Jesus says, whoever serves must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And finally, the last thing, forgive each other freely. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. These are the two great marks of a Christian, giving and forgiving. This summarizes the Christian life. Why? Because Jesus gave his all and he forgave all he could. A genuine Christian is giving and forgiving. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love keeps no record of wrong. And that's pretty tough, but here's a tougher verse. Matthew 6, 14 through 15, Jesus says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And so if you are going to show the love of Christ, you got to be willing to freely forgive. Here's the bottom line. <clears throat> Accepting, encouraging, serving, forgiving. They're not easy, but they are. Some of you have paid attention. Not very many. All right. Here's the bottom line of the whole sermon. Church is not easy. It's not. But it is good. Look at that again, because I think the key word is we. We can make church easy. We could. We can make it where you just come in here on Sunday mornings and you sing some songs and you, you, you hear a sermon or you take a nap and you leave here and you don't apply anything to your life and you just go home and that's it. We can make it easy. But what I want you to notice is what that sign doesn't say. It doesn't say God makes church easy. Because God does not make church easy. Could you imagine what the first disciples would have thought of, the ones who started the church, if they saw that sign? You know, 11 of whom were persecuted for their faith. I don't think they would have said church is easy. God doesn't make church easy but it is good. And listen, there is no perfect church. And this is not a perfect church. But I believe it's a good church. And we're going to fail. I'm going to fail. I have many times. All right? I'm not a perfect leader. I will fail. But I believe this is a good church. Do we lack in areas? Absolutely. Right now, we're down in giving. Right now, we're down in serving, not to mention evangelism and some of the other things. We, we need to improve. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I believe we're a good church. And I want to let you know that I really consider it a privilege to be a part of this church. And I feel blessed to be able to serve alongside of you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the church. We thank you that we are here to, to worship. We are here to... <clears throat> We are here to lead others to Christ. God, we are here to show the love of Christ. And those are not always easy things to do. Growing spiritually, and it can be tough. I mean, we, we get so busy in our daily lives that we, we get going and we look at the Bible and go, I'll, I'll get to that later today. 
And later today comes and, man, I'm tired. I'll do it in the morning. And so it's not always easy. It's not easy being a part of the church. It's not easy being a body of Christ. It's not easy being a part of the family. and It's not easy being the bride. But God, it is good. And we thank you for that goodness. We thank you that we know that when we become a part of the church and when we strive to do these things as a body of the church, that we striving to do it to glorify you, to show you love, that we know that you have promised us a better place. A place where in the future it will be really good. A place called heaven. And so we thank you for that. And I thank you for this body of Christ right here. I, I love this church. I love these people. And I thank you for them. I thank you for their love for you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.